Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. It's not as good as when we were in the hall, but it's very good anyways. Sir? Okay, um, a couple of remarks tonight. Um, can we bring up that Council of Aging uh, thing that um, Joan Roman gave us, Adam? So, so as you know, COVID is still with us. We are, I think about 50% vaccinated in the town of Arlington and we're trying to reach out and get our citizens who are not yet vaccinated, vaccinated. The Council of Aging and Department of Health is doing a push to identify 75 year old and over seniors who have not been vaccinated to get them vaccinated. So we're gonna get a display in one minute that's gonna give you a phone number. If you know any 75 or older seniors who have not been vaccinated, we ask if you can work with them and get them to, he's trying to find it. I think, uh, oh, she can't find it. I, I don't have the document. Uh, it's, okay, I'll have to email it to you again. Um, to, uh, Joan sent it to me. We'll get that up later. So, um, I'm gonna send it to Adam now. Oh, there it is. He found it. So if you have, you know, anyone who's in need of a vaccination who's 75 years old or over, please work with them and call the Council on Aging at that number that's on the screen and let's get them vaccinated. And if you haven't gotten yourself vaccinated, go ahead and do it because next year we're going to be meeting in the town hall and you will need to be vaccinated at that point. We have a few scheduling things to go over. On May 10th, um, no matter where we are in the warrant, we're going to table everything and we're going to use that as our budget night. So all finance articles, budgets, we're going to start with the operating budget. And then if we have a chance and we finish that, we're going to go to the Capital Planning Committee budget on May 10th. And on May 12th at 8 a.m., excuse me, 8 p.m., we're going to start off with Minuteman. So I've invited Dr. Ed Buquillen to present the Minuteman budget and presentation on the 12th at 8 p.m. There, Minuteman's um, presentation is now up on the town meeting webpage. So if you have a chance to take a look at that beforehand, take a look at it. Otherwise, we're going to do the budgets on the 10th and Minuteman on the 12th. And one more thing, there seems to be some confusion out there. I got a email sent to me by one of our town meeting members today saying that we were um, intentionally hiding or deep sixing presentations. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. There was a presentation that was not sponsored by a town meeting member that is actually on the presentation page of ACMI's uh, YouTube, but there is no town meeting sponsor for that. No town meeting member has stepped up to sponsor that or to introduce it so it does not get placed under Article 35 where the person who produced it wants it to be. But until they, and that person who produced that video, I did personally tell them that they need to find a sponsor if they want it to be posted on the annotated warrant. They have not gotten back to me with that. So I'd appreciate it if um, town meeting members would hold off from intentionally inflaming the meeting by spreading false information about what the staff and I are doing with the website and the warrant. I actually took quite offense at that because the staff is working really hard. Um, they're going overtime and more than I can ask of them, more than we can ask of them to put this meeting together, to do everything that's on the background. And then to get an email like that, I found was quite offensive. So I'm gonna to apologize to them for that town meeting member who um, I would rather not name. All right, that's all of my announcements today. Um, I recognize the chair of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Steve DeCourcy. 
the select board, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 5th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Second. Thank you. Um, if you object to that, uh, I request that you use the raise hand feature in Zoom. So we'll give Ms. Wayman a minute to turn that on. If you, it's on. If you object to that, please um, do so now. Otherwise, we'll consider that a unanimous vote. Uh, it looks like that's a unanimous vote. Now, okay, are there any announcements or resolutions? If anyone has a announcement or resolution, please bring it to our attention by using the raise hand feature in Zoom right now. And while we're waiting on that, if any committee or board has a report that they wish to announce or wish to present at this point, please also get my attention using the same feature. Okay, seeing that we have no announcements or resolutions, nor do we have any reports. So um, article 20, Article 21 is now before us. So we're gonna go right into Article 21. Um, they vote to reserve affordable housing for people earning at or under 60% of the AMI. The recommended vote of the board is the select board is no action. And I believe a, there is an amendment on that by Mr. John Sin Bomatsu, Laura Kiesel, and Judith Garber. So, um, is Ms. Garber here? Let's bring Ms. Garber up, see if she wants to present her motion. Hello, uh, Judith Garber, Precinct 4. Um, I'm actually, um, I'm, my co-sponsor, Laura Kiesel, would like to present this. And I believe she's on the call right now. Okay, and is Ms. Kiesel a um, town meeting member? No. Okay, so is she a town resident of the town of Arlington? Yes. Okay, so Ms. Kiesel has a right to speak and she's um, has six minutes and 40 seconds left to go for it. Great, can you hear me? Yes, uh, can we get a second on that motion first? Second. Okay, thank okay. you. Great. Go ahead, Ms. Kiesel. Thank you. So last fall special town meeting, um, there was a warrant passed to establish an affordable housing trust fund, which is great. Um, the trust fund was amended to rely on the definition of the Community Preservation Act for low and moderate income households, with the latter being defined as households making up to 100% area median income or AMI. To put that in play, like, plain language, 100% AMI is nearly $84,000 for a single person household $95,000 for a two-person two household and $107,000 for a three-person household. Uh, the reason why we are concerned about this is when you break um, it down by AMI by race in the Boston metro area, while that aligns with white and Asian households, that is more than double the AMI for black and Latinx households in the Boston metro area, which is $47,000 and $42,000 respectively. Um, furthermore, a 2016 study by the Boston Redevelopment Authority found that more than half of city residents make under $35,000 a year, and that was before COVID. This was something that was actually brought up last summer during the race and housing panel that the town itself hosted when Leon Andrews of the National League of Cities, which has been consulting with the town on racial biases, when he was asked during the panel, what was one thing white majority municipalities like Arlington could do to be more equitable in their housing policies? He said, quote, cities that are committed to centering racial equity require us to use a lens that redefines affordability. And he mentioned specifically earmarking affordable housing funds um, for lower area median incomes so that they would be more inclusive of Black and Latinx households. And he brought up an example of another municipality that had, had similar um, racial disparities in their MI, 
AMI to uh, Arlington. Uh, furthermore, another thing was um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition has found that households making 100% area median income, there is actually no shortage of available homes on the private market um, without being cost burden. In fact, there's a surplus, but for lower income households, there is quite a shortage. For every 100 households making 50% AMI, there are only 57 units available. And for every 100 households making 30% AMI, there are only 36 units available. Um, furthermore, how affordable housing priced for households making 80 to 100% AMI are also exclusionary to people on Section 8 and other housing vouchers who are disproportionately more likely to be disabled and or people of color and especially young black households with school aged children. I'm on a Section 8 voucher and uh, Section 8 was originally intended for use on private market and the problem is the private market has become so prohibitively expensive, especially in metro areas, that a lot of times people have to live in affordable housing to be able to utilize these vouchers. And if even affordable housing is priced too high, we have nowhere to go. And lower income households do not have the options that higher income households have. Um, they, they can't really rent on the private market a lot of the times. And if not, they're forced into congregate settings like nursing homes, institutions, shelters, or the streets, which have been ground zero for mortality rates and infections. Um, I, I'm kind of stuck in my affordable housing. I live on the top floor with no elevator and I can't even move even though it's not a medically accessible apartment for me because there's a lack of any kind of unit under the payment standard on the private market and there's no affordable units in the area. And I'm relatively much more privileged than many other people in my situation and I'm struggling to quickly address why the select board voted no action. They encouraged us to trust the board of trustees to prioritize low income households. They said they agreed with the principle of this. Uh, with all due respect to the board, um, we do need mechanisms to ensure equity. We, we can all have the best of intentions, but if we really wanna make sure we're not going to be perpetuating historical injustices, we need mechanisms codified in our policies to ensure that. Um, secondly, they were concerned that this would con conflict with federal rules for the Community Development Block Grant Program, which allows up to 80% AMI. However, this substitute motion exempts CDBG from it. So that should not be a conflict. I have also heard about the Homes Act uh, concerns about that conflicting, but the Homes Act already asks that 90% of those funds be earmarked for households making at or below 60% AMI. So I don't think that will potentially conflict. I know that last uh, fall town meeting, there was, uh, it was between this amendment and one that did a hard cap at 60% AMI. I feel like this is a compromise. This is not a hard cap at 60% AMI. This is simply asking that the majority of funds be earmarked for households making at or below 60% area median income. We do not quantify what percentage that would be. So this is really the bare minimum. And if, as the select board said, that is already an intention, I don't think there's any harm in just making sure that that is codified in our policies. Um, when I looked up other surveys of affordable housing trust funds around the country, the majority already do ask the bulk of those funds be earmarked for households making at or below 60% area median income. So I'll stop there. Hey, very good. Thank you very much, Ms. Keisel. And that's it for you guys. Uh, Ms. Gob or anything else? Yes, I just wanted to say um, in our research in doing this, um, we found a 2018 Arlington Housing Forum event that found that out of the 700 plus people on the, the wait list for affordable housing, the vast majority of those made $40,000 or less, which is much, much lower than 100% AMI, much lower than 80% AMI. So I think the, we all know that the need is um, for affordable housing is among um, very low income folks and we have to target our efforts there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Potter. you very much. Thank you, Ms. Um, Patricia Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. Fellow town meeting members, mm -hmm. first of all, I want you to know that I have been active in affordable housing endeavors for at least 
30 years and was a member of the group which brought the inclusionary affordable housing zoning bylaw to Arlington. Fellow town meeting members, Ms. Garber's substitute motion might be the only opportunity we as town meeting members will have to help Arlington residents most in danger of becoming homeless, those of the incomes less than 60% of AMI. Speculative developers are threatening them with displacement. It was hoped that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund could help them avoid homelessness when their buildings become acquired for elimination and replacement by luxury and market rate units. That hope has faded away with the adoption of an unfortunate amendment at the special town meeting in November, changing the purpose of the trust to benefit predominantly those of much higher income, six figure incomes. That purpose clause needs to be amended hopefully by next year to make the trust fund a real affordable housing trust fund. Currently the fund is only a housing trust. It is not affordable. It does not comply with Arlington's own zoning bylaw definition of affordability. Ms. Garber's substitute motion would bring a measure of social and economic justice to the fund. Only you, the town meeting members, can do that by approving Ms. Garber's substitute motion. It's time for town meeting to play a very necessary role in the trajectory of this most important fund. Its board may become the most powerful unelected board in Arlington. If you want to have a role in ensuring that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board will protect low-income residents from homelessness, please support Ms. Garber's substitute motion. The select board's role in the fund is very important in that they will appoint its board members. However, retail meeting members can require that at least half of the municipal funds allocated for affordable housing be earmarked for those making 60% or less than area median income. That is what the substitute motion would do. We should remember that the master plan concluded that the only housing Arlington needs is affordable housing and senior housing. The select board claims that they wish to allow the fund's board of trustees to have as much flexibility as other town committees have, but the substitute motion would allow 50% of the funds to be used for whatever flexibility the trustees wish for. And unfortunately, in the case of affordable housing and trust fund, this flexibility would allow more funds to go to subsidize developers of market rate and luxury units. The substitute motion would leave approximately half of the funds for trustees to provide subsidies or use as leverage for projects for higher income families. That provides them plenty of flexibility, too much in my opinion. Affordable Housing Trust Fund board members will have much more power of the purse and are subject to fewer rules and guidelines than other boards or committees. For example, the Community Development Block Grant Committee. The select board and their appointees on various boards, for example, the redevelopment board and their chosen employees in the planning department have shown little or no interest in affordable housing or threats of displacement by developers. There is no reason to think that select board appointees to the affordable housing trust fund board would be any different. Some select board members have been generously supported by residential developers and realtors who may not wish for affordability requirements in their projects. Just a few days ago, a member of the redevelopment board was asked at a precinct meeting if the redevelopment board had made Ms. any Ms. Warden, to increase Ms. affordability. Ms. Warden, please keep on scope of the article. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, in the last year, he said no, they had not made any progress in affordable housing, but they may have conversations after the pandemic is over about it. Well, fellow town meeting members, we hear a lot of inspiring speeches from planning officials and politicians about the need for affordable housing. They talk the talk, plenty of conversations, but they do not walk the walk. This article is an opportunity for the select board and the redevelopment board to begin to walk that walk. 
but they have so far declined to do so. Profits for residential developers appear to be of much more importance than the well-being of residents. We town meeting members cannot just wash our hands of what happens to our lower income residents when homelessness increases if we have given away the help they could have received from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Karen Kelleher? No. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, Karen Kelleher, Precinct 5, and a member of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. I want to congratulate the proponents of this warrant article and urge you all to listen carefully to all of their arguments about the urgent need for affordable housing and the equity issues associated with it. I agree wholeheartedly with the principles that they're advancing, and I hope that you do too. That being said, if this article was a resolution providing a statement of support for prioritizing lower income housing, I would favor it. I think they have gotten your attention with this resolution. They've educated the town and they've created some political will to take action. And for that, I applaud them and I thank them. Um, they have many of us and myself included wanting to vote for this to make a, the statement that they urge us to make about equity. That describes you too. I only hope you're moved enough to stay engaged in this conversation for the long haul, because moving from that statement to a strategy that will actually create affordable housing units will require a lot more work and some difficult choices. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why, because I really wanna address the issue that uh, Ms. Warden has just talked about relating to private developers, because we in Arlington are not creating much affordable housing it's because we don't have a proactive strategy. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund has the potential to provide one, but we're going to need to fund it. And second, we are taking lots of actions that are actually taking another option for creating affordable housing off the table, and that is to get private developers to build it for free. And it's part of why I want to talk a little bit further about this article. I have to step back though, because I, I am the person who proposed the amendment last year that created more flexibility in the trust to be able to fund housing units at higher incomes. And I'm gonna tell you why uh, shortly, but there is no one here who is advocating for higher income housing as an alternative to, or in lieu of uh, very low income housing. By saying so, we're really setting up a false dichotomy and a false choice. We're really not making a choice between one or the other, and we can apply our dollars equally to them both. They're basically created in different ways, and I want to speak to that. But first, I have to start with the basic principle that affordable housing is difficult to create. It's hard, and it's hard because it's a math problem that doesn't work. The rents and home prices that lower income people can pay are just not enough to pay for the construction and operation of the housing that they need to live in. That's a structural inequity that we aren't gonna solve in town meeting, but we do need to solve that problem if we wanna take action. This statement, this act, this uh, particular Warren article isn't gonna get us one unit closer to actually doing that. There's two ways to solve that financial feasibility problem. The first is to seek and to provide public subsidies. We're see I hope we will do that ultimately through the trust it's what the uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington uses to create uh, affordable housing in town. And Arlington can and should do more of that. And to do that, we're going to have to create conditions that make affordable housing developers want to build in Arlington. We haven't done that and we need to do that. But there's a second way to create protected affordable housing. And that is to get private developers to cross subsidize it with excess profits from market rate units. Where we have a robust market, Massachusetts has two ways we can do that. The first is an inclusionary zoning law, which Mrs. Warden already spoke about. And we're going to Ms. talk Kelleher, about it. Yes. You're straying a little bit from the um, actual article itself. We're talking about a 60% um, AMI. Um, yeah, if you'll bear if, with me for just a minute, Mr. Moderator, I'll bring it back. Well, I'll give you 30 seconds because you are off scope. Well, here's the point of going off on this tangent. Um, Develop, private developers are typically only going to build housing at 70 or 80% of area median income. There's reasons for that related to the feasibility of their projects and their willingness to deal with the subsidy programs. 
So as a result, if we're not really making a choice between 60% housing and higher income housing, in private development, we're making a choice between 70 or 80% affordable housing or no more affordable housing. And so we may have the opportunity to actually get more affordability in town and not be able to take it if we limit our choices. We have tremendous gaps in the affordable housing we need for our community. That includes very low income people, people at 60% of area median income, people at 65, 75, 80% of area median income. If we wanna make Arlington a leader in driving affordable housing or even step up to do our part um, to solve our region's affordable housing crisis, we can't afford to leave either of these strategies off the table. We're about to start a process for setting housing priorities. We just created an affordable housing trust fund last fall. When the trustees are appointed, their first job will be to create a process for proposing a proactive strategy for driving affordable housing. There will be a public process around that and it will need to be approved by the select board. We're also about to start a public process to inform a new housing production plan. That will evaluate all our housing needs and the opportunities we might have to respond to them. We're asking the trustees to tackle a very difficult problem. And so far we haven't given them any money or power. I think we should at least leave them the room to set a strategy. There isn't anybody currently arguing to create moderate income housing instead of low income housing. And the standard proposed for the trust is actually the exact same standard that applies to the Community Preservation Act committee, that committee has never funded a unit that actually is targeted ahead Ms. of Ms. Okay, Kelleher, the, the members are yelling scope. I'm talking about income levels. Uh, I'm okay. talking about the 60% area median income level. Do you feel it's okay. out of scope? Go ahead. But Thank you. You have 45 seconds. There are also some unintended technical issues this uh, law could create. We just created a trust fund. I think we should not take options off the table before the trustees are even appointed. Many of us are saying we support affordable housing, just not in this location, not if it'll increase traffic or density, or if it's for people who aren't low income or not, or if it places a tax burden on us. There's a thin line between affordable housing support and NIMBYism when we make our other priorities absolutes. We narrow the options and take tools out of the toolbox. It's hard to create affordable housing. We're not gonna create it if we don't make compromises and hard choices. I hope we can stop arguing about what we don't want and narrowing our options and instead roll up our sleeves together and develop an informed, proactive strategy that we're prepared to support. If you still feel you wanna support this article as a statement of your support for deeply affordable housing, I'm nonetheless thrilled you feel that way. And I hope it means you will also be willing to keep showing up for the conversation and also make the hard financial and land decisions, use decisions that will turn this statement into a strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kelleher. Uh, Daniel Dunn. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Daniel Dunn, Precinct 21, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. So uh, as a previous speaker, I, sal I salute the proponent's intent, but I do not uh, support the motion. It is a solution without a problem. If our town controlled money was going to people who close to median income, that would be a problem. But let's walk the walk, as we might say, and talk about what's actually happening. For instance, on 423 of this month, or excuse me, last month, uh, the town posted the uh, application for affordable housing rental lottery for Downing Square. 30% median income, uh, 16 units, 60% area median, 60% uh, median income for uh, the remaining 32 units. This is not money that is going to the people who are close to median income. The proponents quoted the speaker from the League of Cities. And one of the things that he said, which I think is really accurate, is that you have to make solutions that are customized to your community. We can't just, we, we need a solution that's customized for Arlington. That solution comes from these commissioners and the commissioners have not even met yet. It is too early to tie their hands. It is too early for us to say that they're doing it wrong. They know already from the debate, because they're here, because they're listening, what we want. The CDBG is just one of many sources of this money. And the restrictions that we put on now will be restricting our access to future money. 
I encourage town meeting to let the commissioners make their choices and only worry about it if they we think they got it wrong afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Carolyn Murray. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Caroline. How about now? Yes. Caroline Murray, Precinct 12. I have a question on the substitute motion and talking about area median income and what is area? Is area Arlington or is it Boston or is it national? Um, hold on, please. Um, Attorney Heim. Mr. Moderator, I, I would actually prefer to defer that question uh, to either the planning director or the um, or, or uh, Ms. Kelleher, who. Uh, yeah, who let's said, let's um, ask let's ask Ms. Rate. Is, is Ms. Rate with us? Yes, I am, Mr. Moderator. Hi. Can you Hi. tell us what the area is? Certainly. It's Jenny Rate, the Director of Planning and Community Development. We're talking about the greater Boston area, which is under the Boston, Cambridge, Newton, MA to New Hampshire St Statistical Metropolitan Area, or SMSA. So it is a very broad area that draws the area median income. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rate. Ms. Rate. To answer your question, Ms. Murray? Yes, thank you. Do you have anything further? No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Amos Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Amos Meeks, Precinct 3. Um, so I want to say up front that um, in terms of housing and, and zoning and these sorts of topics, I'm sort of still learning on, on this. and. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for Ms. Kelleher's expertise. Um, I read the document that she sent out um, before this and I thought there's a lot of great info in there. Um, so from my perspective, um, from what I've learned, I feel like there are sort of two very broad types of affordable housing. There's sort of deeply affordable housing, you know, this 60% um, AMI and below. And then there's, you know, other definitions of affordable housing, um, like the 80% threshold that I think is used for, um, you know, things like 40B and, and that sort of thing. Um, and my understanding is that um, for really the deeply affordable housing, you really need public funding uh, to make it happen and significant public funding. And um, according to what Ms. Kelleher wrote, this exists at the federal and the state level, I think. Um, and so I see this affordable housing trust fund as kind of adding onto that and creating a source at the local level of the town and being a source of public funding um, that's sort of Arlington specific. And so it makes sense to me that the, to have this housing trust fund focus on um, this sort of deeply affordable housing that, requ that really requires this, this additional public funding and to, um, for, for the not so deeply affordable housing um, have policies and um, other ways of sort of incentivizing the, um, the market to create some of that um, through you know, zoning, um, inclusionary zoning, uh, these sorts of things. Um, and I believe in, in what Ms. Kelleher wrote, um, the federal and state funding are already in, in at least many cases um, restricted to going to 60% AMI or less. Um, so it seems in line with that to uh, require that for um, the housing trust fund. Although um, I think it is an important point that the amendment, I believe, only requires a majority to go towards 60% AMI. Um, so there is still flexibility for 70%, um, 80%, you know, if that's needed in order to access additional funding from other sources or things like that. Um, and there was a technical concern that, that Ms. Kelleher raised um, about where you know, this requirement means that one project falling through could jeopardize funding for another project um, that's sort of unrelated, but sort of scheduled at the same time in order to meet the proposed requirement. Um, hopefully that wouldn't be an issue as long as they are sort of not towing super close to this majority line. Um, although um, I think this is still a, a very valid concern. Um, so overall, I'm 
generally supportive of this because it, it seems like uh, the right sort of focus and seems like a good thing to sort of uh, direct and ensure rather than, um, you know, waiting to see if there's a problem and then needing to address it later on or, or things like that. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Marjorie. Thank you, sir. Um, Stephen DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Stephen DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Just want to make a few comments on, on our vote and, and to follow up on some statements that were made uh, earlier uh, in the evening. And, and to echo Mr. Dunn's statement, we the Select Board did certainly salutes the, the proponent's intent here. Our concern, speaking for myself, was that one, we have not created the trust, the trustees have not um, been selected yet. We're, we're going to put out a statement for expressions of interest within the next few weeks. And the bylaw itself sets a ceiling on what can happen, not what will actually happen. 100% of the funds could be used for below 60% or below 50%. Um, other communities in Massachusetts that have municipal uh, trust funds, and I believe there's about 115 communities, I'm not aware of a community that has the restriction within the bylaw. Somerville has a restriction on income that the trustees put in the de declaration of trust. And they had three different categories um, that for 20% will serve households between zero and 50%. 20% will serve households with income between 51 and 80%, 10% between 81 and 110%. That's the type of review an analysis that I would expect that the trustees would undertake over the next year once they're put together as part of the action plan to bring back to the board for approval. But the Somerville bylaw itself mirrors chapter 44, section 55C, um, which, is, which is what our bylaw mirrors. The other thing I wanna point out is there's nothing going into the trust this year. And until we get, a, if we do pass a real estate transfer fee tax, um, which won't, would not take place for a few years at, 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 the, at a minimum. The, the only source of funding is Community Preservation Act uh, funds, which town meeting will, will vote on that. So at least for this year, there's nothing that's gonna be put in the trust fund. There's no actions that are gonna be taken. The board felt that if we allowed the trustees to develop an action plan, to come back to us, identify priorities in the short term. We didn't want to limit their ability to do that over the next year. Um, and there was a statement about CDBG funds earlier and, and CDBG funds, the select board determines how that money is spent. I've been on the board for two years. All of the funds for CDBG that have gone to housing, 100% have gone for households that earn less than 50%. And in this year, there was a number of funds that went to households that are in less than 30%. So um, I just wanted to, to really repeat one last time in, in terms of the bylaw itself, we don't wanna to have to change every year if circumstances change going forward. We wanna have a construct that we can follow from year to year through the trustees. And we certainly um, can set priorities that, um, in the, in the short term and even in the long term to the trustees actions that support affordable housing for 60% or below AMI. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, Gordon Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, I concur with Ms. Keller, Mr. Dunst, and Mr. Corsi's um, comments. Um, and um, perhaps uh, the Director of Planning could tell us, since we modified the um, article last fall to be uh, consistent with CPA criteria, Community Preservation Criteria, what actually are the criteria uh, that we restrict the fund at this point as approved by town meeting last fall? Uh, Ms. Ray, can we get an answer to that? Jenny Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. The limit is 100% of the area median income, uh, which, is, which was referenced earlier by a previous speaker. That is the same as the Community Preservation Act, which is called uh, community housing. And units that are 
targeted to 80% or below the area median income, those units can count on the subsidized housing inventory that the town maintains. Anything between 80 to 100% cannot, um, but to answer the question, it's 100% area median income. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Um, the um, question I had was, oh dear, which one of these many? Well, in the um, proposed amendment, as I, my reading was, oh dear, where is it? Um, okay. Oh, well, it says, um, it says, um, dear, could someone put the amendment, the, the, um, the article, yeah. The we'll bring we'll, we'll put it up on the screen. I've lost it on my screen here. There it is. We'll pull it over. There you go, Mr. James. Okay, my question, my question um, for, for on the wording is the impl implications of um, it says a majority of all funds um, expended by the trust fund um, shall be 60 or, or greater. Um, is that of the gross funds, even though we exempt the monies from the CBDG? Perhaps it, Mr. Hine can clarify that. Yeah, it looks unclear. That's why I'm asking the question, Mr. Moderator. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Mr. Hine, can you enlighten us as to that. Uh, Mr. Moderator, can you just keep keep the substitute motions over? We can look at it so I can sure. really illustrate it. Thank you. Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, the way that I would read uh, the substitute motion, because the uh, language exempts CDBG funds, I would say it's the majority of basically non-CDBG funds. I think that's consistent with what the proponents are are setting forth. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Hine. Um, so um, I think I think this this well-intentioned amendment um, and my question about it just then points to the, the the troubles with trying to prescribe too much within a bylaw um, what you want to actually happen. And that the um, affordable housing trust fund members are tasked with making a, um, a plan, I believe, and that those regulations are much better. The regulations are much better as regulations and not within the bylaw. For example, um, uh, this is how we work recycling um, uh, regulations. The, those are promulgated by the DPW. And just, just this meeting, earlier this meeting, I believe we passed a stormwater management um, bylaw. But if you went to the back of your select board report, there's pages upon pages of pages of the actual regulations. And the, the good part about having it be in the regulations, or in this case, the Affordable Housing Trust plan as made as, as determined by the trust fund uh, board of trustees is that can be changed without an action from town meeting. And so that's much cleaner. We don't, any, anytime there's a mistake, as you noticed in our, in our zoning bylaws or an in, in, inadvertent error, or we change from select board to uh, from board of selectmen to select board, we have to go back and change that in the bylaws. It's very, it's very laborious and inefficient. And so I would, um, for not only for the reasons expressed by others earlier, but for these um, reasons that, that I've just stated, I, I, I would urge a vote against this article. Um, I expect that the uh, Affordable Housing Board of Trustees will, will um, take these thoughts to task and, um, to, to, the, the, and as they go to the task of um, uh, take, take these comments as, uh, in consideration when they go to the task of formulating the, the plan. And I'm sure these members um, and, and their supporting um, other members that support this will show up at those meetings and lobby for these types of um, stepped increases in different parts of the um, util utilization of the funds. And so thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. Ms. Rowe has a point of order. Clarissa Rowe. Um, Mr. Moderator, thank you so much for hearing me. 
Okay, um, Mr. Wanna, what's your point of order? My point of order as the acting chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee, I wanna just say that um, Ms. Rate is correct about the way the law is written. However, this is a local committee and our local committee is firmly supportive of not having 100% AMI. In fact, the money that we have okay. given Ms. to the planning department for Ms. Rowe. the work that That's needs to be done for affordable housing, John, let, <clears throat> let me finish my sentence, yeah. has been voted by the entire committee to be a lot less than 60% AMI. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I appreciate your statement. and. Um, <laughs> but that would have been more of an argument as opposed to a point of order. It could um, be. <laughs> it, it, well, I'm the moderator and I think it is. But if there's nothing else in your point of order, I think we're good to go. Thank uh, you. Mr. Ciano, thank you, Ms. Rowe. <laughs> okay, I did it. Uh, Frank Ciano, Precinct 15. So have trustees been appointed as yet or no? I believe Mr. DeCourcy told us they have not been appointed yet. Okay, so that does not please me. Uh, so then how would this be funded? We have the CPA, the override, the transfer, the school committee wants more money, town meeting members want well, to be Ms. paid. Mr. So Ciano, I, I guess I'm off we're scope. Talking, okay, we're, I'll, yeah, I'll be yeah. quiet. So we're how talking about how we're going to spend it, not how we're getting money into it. Y yes. Um, so I'm in favor of this. So I, I don't get why the select board wants to wait. My mom always said, why put off today? Why put off tomorrow what you can do today? So why can't we just support this? Well, that's what they're asking us to do. And that's what we're arguing so about. Then I'm in favor of it then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Anna Hankin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, Anna Hankin, Precinct 6. Um, I would like to speak in support of this article um, and the amendment. Um, I definitely want to really reiterate the fact that this is only asking for a majority. So if we really need to support something up to 80 or even 100% AMI, there's still 49 cents out of every dollar from this trust fund that goes to those projects. I'm concerned that we would think that we should be using the majority or all of these funds for a project like that, but saying over and over again how this would tie the committee's hands. Um, and I'm honestly super concerned about how anti-accountability a lot of the discussion around this has been. Um, the, we should want to address those in the greatest need and we shouldn't be afraid of putting that into a bylaw and making it codified in law and official. Um, we should state that as a priority in law for this trust fund. Um, and honestly, I think a lot of this conflict comes from thinking that this trust fund is going to fix all of the housing problems and address all of the housing problems in Arlington. And I think this trust fund probably should be directed at those in greatest need. And to reiterate what Amos said earlier, we really should be thinking about having different kinds of solutions for those 60% and above and those 60% and below. This isn't going to solve everything, but we can really make the biggest impact with this trust fund if we direct it towards those in the most need. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Hankin. Uh, Ms. Liebehayam? Liebehayam, Precinct 11. I move the question and all matters before it. Okay, uh, can we get a second on that? Do we have a second on motion to terminate debate? It has been seconded. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on the matter and all 
on the article and all matters before it. We'll take first our motion, our vote to terminate debate. So we had a few database errors last uh, Wednesday. We've spoken with um, Mr. Pato, the developer, and he made a few recommendations to us. One is that we're going to, Adam will start the voting table. Don't everybody rush over to participate right away because that causes a database error, just like we're getting here. So if the precincts will go over serially in groups of seven, one through seven would go first, approximately 10 seconds later, um, eight through 14, another five seconds later, 10 seconds later, the um, 15 through 21. We've increased the voting time clock to 90 seconds. So you'll see up there, you still have time. And if you do get a database error, just refresh your page and you'll get to the voting portal. Now I just did so and I have my voting portal up. So if you'll want to vote one for yes, if you want, the, if you're voting in favor of the amendment or two for no, if you're voting against the amendment. And we have a couple other things. Use the chat, the chat feature on Zoom if you cannot use the portal. So if you are going to use the chat feature on Zoom, go ahead and type in yes if you want the amendment and vote no if you don't. And third, and another thing, if you can't use the portal and you cannot use the chat feature, then you can text your vote. So we've got a new met method here. If you get your foot cell phone out and text yes or no to 617-575-9266. So I think we need your um, last name and what your vote yes or no is. And we're gonna try all of these methods to get everybody's vote. Yes, Ms. Um, Wayman, you're muted, Julie, I can't hear you. Uh, people are clarifying that we are voting to terminate debate, not- Oh, on. shit. <laughs> Sorry. We're voting to terminate debate. Damn, darn it. All right, so if you want to terminate debate, I went through all that stuff about the amendment. Oh man, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, if you want to terminate debate, vote one for yes and two for no. One to terminate debate and two to continue debating the issue. So I'm sorry, one to terminate debate and two for, to continue it. So, Let's have everybody go back and make sure they voted the right thing on the terminate debate. Now it says right there, article one, terminate debate. So one yes to terminate and two no. So we're gonna leave it open for one second, to make sure everybody gets their vote to terminate debate. And we have any further text or chat votes? Nope, I think we're all set. All right, let's close voting. We'll see if debate has been terminated. The motion passes 73%, two thirds vote required. So debate is terminated. One hundred seventy-four in favor, and sixty-two in opposition. So we've terminated the debate. We're going to run through these several screens. Then we'll take the vote on the amendment. And I apologize for my off-color remark when I was told I had it wrong. And Mr. Mich Michelle Phelan has a point of order. Let's see what Michelle's point of order is while we look at the screens.
Oh, she put her hand down. Maybe she doesn't have it anymore. Ms. Phelan, do you still have a point of order? Mr. Moderator, Michelle Phelan, Precinct 4, I apologize. Um, I should have taken my hand down. I apologize. That's okay. Don't worry. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Warden has a point of order. Oh, Mr. Mario, yes, uh, John Word in Precinct 8. Um, my question relates to uh, voting. If, um, if the machine does what it did last uh, time we were here together um, and you can't get to the portal, uh, there was a phone number to call. Now, yes. But uh, is there a phone number to call? Suppose uh, some people including me, do not have the capacity to text. Mm -hmm. So um, earlier in the evening, um, I chatted and questioned and answered to Patricia um, two different phone numbers, um, which, and I'll give you uh, Miss Brazil's phone number again. It's 781-316-3073. Seven, it's so we, you should be able to call that number, Mr. Warden, and she'll be able to get that but suppose call. It, suppose it rings busy as it did several times last, last meeting. Well, we think we have that solved with the other issues. Um, okay. If you'll give me a phone, your phone number, I can call you and give you a private number that you'll be able to call. Well, I hope it won't be necessary, but um, my, my phone number is... 781-646-8303. 8303. All right, if you'll yes, allow me to call you during the break, I'll call you and give you a private phone number that you can make a call right. to if necessary. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I hope it will not be necessary. And I, I hope that you, you will keep voting open until everyone who wants to vote is allowed to vote. That's Thank what you. we're trying to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we're now going to go to the amendment and take a vote on the amendment now that debate's been terminated. Okay. This takes so much longer. Okay, so we are now going to open for enable voting on the amendment. If you're in, so precincts one through seven, please go to the portal. And after a few minutes, if precincts. So we get a database error when everybody's accessing the portal at once and it just causes a little bit of a hiccup. So eight through seven, eight through 15, go over to the portal. And then the rest. Now, if you're in favor of the amendment and you want to amend it and have that amendment become the main motion, vote one for yes. If you're opposed to the amendment and don't want it, vote two for no. If you can't use the portal, please chat your vote. Um, all you have to do is type in yes or no. And if you can't use the portal or the chat, then you can text your vote to 614-575-9266. So portal first, if you can, well, one for yes for the amendment, two if you wish to vote against it. If that doesn't work, use the chat feature. And if that doesn't work, text 617-575-9266. And if all else fails, you can still call Miss Brazil at 781-316-3071. But that's only one person on one line and you might get a busy signal. So you'd have to be persistent.
And someone is upset because they say I'm blaming town meeting members for the database error. I am not doing so. I'm saying that it's a system issue that we have a lot of users and we're using a lot of bandwidth at once and we have a huge draw on the system. So we're trying to stretch out the uh, instant issues. So do we have any other chat votes or any other votes that are not using the portal? Well, we all set. We're all set with the text votes. And I'm just waiting for to get the thumbs up on the chat votes. Is that Miss Wayman? Almost, okay. She's got one or two left to go. I don't even, oh. Well, Lauren has her screen turned off, so I can't see if she's giving me a thumbs up or not. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Lauren. Okay. So I think we can close voting. So the amendment fails 35%. We got a 84 in the positive and 154 in the negative. to 154, the amendment fails and it's a vote and I declare it. Now we'll go back to the recommended vote of no action once we've run through the screens. Okay, now we're going to take a vote on the main vote of, as recommended by the select board in their report, and that's a vote of no action. No town meeting members, please migrate over to, we're going to open, confirm, we're going to open voting. Seven. No. Seven one two seven, please go over. Uh, Miss Bloom has a point of order. We're voting on the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen of no action. So yes for no action, and no for no no action. Um, let's hear Miss Bloom's point of order. Uh, Eight through fifteen can go over, and then. 16 through 21. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Yes, ma'am. What's your point of order? I was just wondering, since it is a, since the select board has it as a vote of no action, do we have to vote on this? Yes, we have to dispose of every single article. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roderick Holland has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roderick Holland, Precinct 7. Uh, this is a technical point of order. Um, you have correctly pointed out that the system has a known failure mode. Um, and you have correctly um, uh, described the workaround, which is to refresh and do it again. Um, 
we're very fortunate that A, we understand the failure modes and B, we understand the workarounds. That makes for a system that is not beautiful, but it is functional. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, we have to vote on every single uh, article, even if it's a no action. So we vote one yes for no action, unless you feel compelled to vote against it. But either way, the action will fail. So if it's no action, you basically may as well vote for it. Um, okay, so do we have, okay, a whole bunch of people have points of order. If they're having, having to do with the vote, uh, I haven't explained it well. Mr. Harrelson, what's your point of order? Nancy Bloom has a point of order. Okay, we're just down to Nancy Bloom. Hello, Mr. Moderator. I, Brooks Harrelson, Precinct 16. I withdrew my point of order. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just as I called your name. Sorry, sir. Let's have Ms. Bloom's point of order. Uh, Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. I'm sorry, I thought I'd withdrawn my point of order. I apologize. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if anyone has a, um, Ashley or Lauren, if you can give me the thumbs up. I'm, I think I've got it from Adam for the text votes. We're good to go. Okay, let's close voting. Oh, Julie's asking for one more second. We're entering one more vote. So people that have texted in or called in or chatted in, you can see it says right next to them, voted verbally. Those are the ones that we enter into the system manually. So we're getting all clear. We've manually entered all the votes that needed to be entered. So we're gonna close voting. And point of order, excuse me, the, um, Vote of no action passes by 190 to 49. That's a vote and I so declare it. And that closes article 21 and brings us to article 22. We have the recommended vote of the select board of no action, but we do have a substitute motion by Ms. Hinken. So what we're gonna do is finish going through our screens. When we get through with all our screens, Mr. Karalski will show us the article and then he'll show us Ms. Henkin and we'll bring Ms. Henkin up to introduce her. Um, substitute motion. This is a voter provision of town email addresses for town meeting members. The recommended vote of Board of Selectmen was no action. And... Uh, Mr. Moderator? Yes. Um, I'd actually like to table my substitute motion are you uh -huh. making a motion to table the entire article? Yes. Okay, we have a motion to table the entire article. Um, before we take that, we'll ask Mr. DeCourcy for his point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I was just gonna raise the same point Ms. Hankin did. I had a discussion with Mr. Diggins earlier and I understand he may be working with Ms. Hankin. So I'm, I'm glad she brought the motion to table. That That's all I was gonna discuss. Okay. Um, do we have a second on the motion to table? Second, yes, second. Okay, it's been seconded. So we have a motion to table, which would be put it on the table and we'll bring it up another evening. If um, anyone objects to the motion to table, please use the um, raise hand feature in Zoom. So if you're objecting to the motion to table, please go ahead and use the raise hand feature in Zoom as soon as it's ready to go. And I think it's turned on. It is turned on. It's a unanimous vote to table. So we are tabling article 23. We're gonna take that up at another night 
um, we were requested. Thank you. So this one is tabled. Um, So we're tabling 22, that brings us to article 23. Affordable overlay study. We have a vote of no action by the select board. No, oh, no, excuse me, 23 was on the consent agenda. 24 would be our next article. Article 24, Home Rule Legislation Ranked Choice Voting. And who wishes to present on this? Ms. Rodria? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Um, the Select Board voted in favor of ranked choice voting. It was a four to one vote. The board was unanimous in its support of RCV for single seat elections. The four to one vote reflected multi-seat elections. I'd like to turn over the rest of the time to Mr. Greg Dennis, the uh, chair of the e election modernization committee. Okay, so you're, is Mr. Dennis a um, town resident? Yes, he is. Okay, so he has a right to speak. So he'll be using the remainder of the seven minutes. Uh, <clears throat> sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Greg Dennis from Precinct 1 and Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Mr. Moderator, at this time, I'd like to ask that my recorded presentation be played. Sure. I'm Greg Dennis from Precinct 1, presenting Article 24 on behalf of the Election Modernization Committee. The recommended vote of the select board proposes home rule legislation to adopt ranked choice voting for elections to townwide offices. To understand the benefits of ranked choice voting, let's look at a key problem in the voting system we use today. That's the problem of vote splitting. Let's say we're holding an election for favorite candy and two candidates enter the race, Reese's peanut butter cups and candy corn. Early polling shows about 60% prefer Reese's to candy corn. So it looks like peanut butter cups will win handily. That is until, uh-oh, a third candidate decides to enter the race, Reese's Minis. This is bad news for Reese's fans. Now their votes are split. And on election day, candy corn wins with less than a majority, less than 50% of the vote. Vote splitting has a number of negative consequences for our elections. First, as we saw in the example, it means that those we elect may lack majority support. Now, while non-majority outcomes don't happen in every election, the threat of vote splitting is ever present, and that threat causes prospective candidates to bow out of the race before it has even begun. Fewer candidates means a less diverse candidate pool. It means fewer campaigns drawing voters to the polls. In some, it means campaigns are less welcoming, less inclusive, and less engaging than they could be. These are some of the problems that ranked choice voting can help fix. So how does it work? Well, here are some of the ballots that we see in town elections today. Depending on the number of seats we are filling, we may be asked to vote for up to one, or up to two, or up to three, and Article 24 would replace them all with this ranked ballot, where voters can choose just one, or if they want, mark a second choice in the second column, third choice in the third column, as many or as few choices as they like. And it doesn't matter how many seats we are filling, one, two, or three, the ballot and instructions stay the same. To see how the votes are counted, Let's look at a select board race between the four candidates on this ballot, Mary, Diego, Sally, and Robbie. We start by counting just the first choices, just the marks in this first column. Mary has 36 first choices, Diego 24, Sally 12, and Robbie 28. Mary is in the lead, but with ranked choice, you can't win with only 36% of the vote. Instead, the last place candidate, here that Sally, is dropped and everyone that voted for Sally has their vote instantly count towards their next choice instead. Then we continue to drop the last place candidate and transfer their votes until only two candidates remain. When only two are left, the candidate with more than 50% of the vote, a majority, wins the seat. Congratulations, Mary. But what if we're filling two seats on the select board? Well, then Mary wins the first of those two seats. 
and then we count the ballots over again from the beginning, but with Mary excluded, to fill the second seat. Again, we drop the lowest vote getter until two candidates are left, at which point the candidate with the majority of the votes wins the second seat. I'm happy to answer any questions about how the votes are counted, but it's important to keep in mind that regardless of the mechanics of the count, the task of the voter remains simple, which is to fill out this ballot. And we know from experience around the country and around the world that voters can handle this. And in exchange for using the ranked ballot and counting the votes in this way, town elections would see a number of benefits. One, we'll ensure that the candidates we elect always have majority support. Two, by ending vote splitting, we'll encourage a larger and more diverse set of candidates to run. There's evidence that this benefits women and people of color in particular. Three, we'll help boost voter turnout because more candidates means more people pulling their friends and neighbors out to vote. Four, we'll limit gamesmanship because lobbying your supporters to bullet vote for you becomes an ineffective strategy under ranked choice. And five, candidates will have an extra incentive to stay positive and civil to pick up the second and third choices from supporters of their opponents. What's the impact of a yes vote? Well, if town meeting votes yes, and if the state approves the home rule legislation this year, then Arlington voters will decide whether to adopt ranked choice voting on the April 22 town ballot. And if Arlington voters say yes, our first election with ranked choice would be in April 2023. Importantly, that means, one, even if we vote yes, we'd still have nearly two years for more public education before ranked choice voting is ever used, and two, a yes vote is ultimately a vote to let Arlington voters have a say. In November, 64% of Arlingtonians said yes to adopting ranked choice voting at the state and federal level. Please vote yes in this motion so that they can decide whether they want it for local elections too. Thank you. Thank you for playing that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the recorded video, there's a fact sheet and a select board example in your materials. Uh, with answers to common questions. And I'd like to add that uh, in addition to a yes vote on the article, the committee is also urging a no vote on Mr. Schlickman's proposed amendment, which would limit ranked choice voting to single seat elections only. That amendment would deny key benefits to some of our highest profile races where vote splitting is a serious concern. It would also give voters an inconsistent and unpredictable experience. For example, it would mean that in some years, the select board race would use ranked choice voting and in other years it would not. Our proposal for multi-seat elections is straightforward. It just repeats the single seat method, the same single seat process to fill each of the available seats one at a time. It's based on the same rationale and offers the same benefits to multi-seat elections as it does to single ones. So please vote no on that amendment and then yes on the main motion. Lastly, I'd like to thank the other 14 members of the election modernization committee, including the outgoing chair and town meetings outgoing assistant town moderator, Jim O'Connor, uh, for their service to the committee in the town. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Schlickman. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, it's, it's 930. Do we want to do this after the break? Sure, that's a good idea. Let's take our 10 minute break, then Mr. Schlickman will be the first one up. And I do have a, a PowerPoint that I want to narrate it with. So uh, if we'll have that queued up, ready to go. Thank you. So we're going to take our 10 minute break and we'll see you all in 10, 12 minutes. And we're going to play a piece that was produced by a Arlington High School student, Daniel. I didn't get his last name. Um, that he won an award through the um, community access cable television station um, association for this piece. And I think it was a nationwide award given to one of our high school students through the ACMI. And so he's, we're gonna get to see that during the break. So thank you, we'll see you soon. Oh, yes on my amendment and then on everything else.
We are so happy to give you a glimpse into the hearts and minds of our Arlington student artists. We will continue to ask them, through their art, to tell us what they are thinking and feeling about their lives and about the world around them. this project was to give students a way to reflect on the school closure. We asked them to share their experience of life away from school and friends and all of their normal activities. We wanted students to understand that making art can help us to process things that can't always be put into words. is really amazing about all of this social distancing artwork is that we now have this wonderful record of what life was like at this time from many different perspectives. I really enjoyed seeing the different ways that each student interpreted this prompt into an artwork. From abstract art that used color to describe feeling, to students that drew a map of their house. And you don't give yourself enough credit. Listen to your mom when she tell you don't sweat it. Love, when you slow it down, you know what's true. Ooh, ooh, ooh. these last few years has been the best way to prepare them for art making in these new circumstances. They are resilient, they are resourceful, and they will find a way to express themselves through art. things will ever feel the same now. for this online art show is a way to reach out to each other in this very unique and isolating time. to go to school anymore and learn at school and play at school. Art helped me to be happy, creative, and connect with my cousins and friends all over the world. J. 
shining in my bed Pillows made of lead I think I'm drowning in the fall But nothing lasts at all And if I close my eyes instead Art has helped me express myself on a sheet of paper because sometimes I just get really bored. There's like basically nothing to do. So I just grab a sheet of paper and start writing. Life away from school has had its ups and downs, and art has helped me express myself during this crazy time. It has also helped me find a fun, calming activity to brighten my day. other people happy that's what it's really all about just making other people happy
Authentic culture, party, eccentric, multimedia, shock, creative, happy, helpful artist. We are artists. video and he won a an award for that he collected all of those from um, arlington students over the last year their reflections of life during covid in the schools um, we're just trying to queue up mr schlickman's powerpoint presentation and then we're going to bring up with him as soon as adam comes back on and gives us the okay that he has that ready to go Find it, Adam? Nope. Oh, okay, took him a second. This is kind of the problem where you don't reload these things up into the YouTube so we can play them. We got a second on Mr. Schlickman's motion. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, Mr. Schlickman's motion has been seconded. Okay, is Paul still live with us? Paul, are you still there? I am now here. Okay. So you're on. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, I'm going to ask that you vote no action on Article 24. If it ain't broke, please don't break it. Next slide, please. It, it, the, the Election Modernization Committee, when it was conceived uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the select board envisioned it as being the town, uh, looking at the town's election practices, policies, and opportunities for improvement. And this community viewed itself as an advocacy or organization for ranked choice voting. So the mission changed. Um, and in 2020, they looked at uh, the criticism of the ranked choice voting article to special town meeting as without merit. Next slide, please. This is the text of the select board's report on Article 36 of 2019. The select board urges town meeting to establish a study committee to comprehensively examine the town's election practices, policies, and opportunities for improvement. Next slide, please. 
And there's a list of nine things that they were supposed to look at. Now, they did come before the special town meeting last year and with a recommendation and a very good one to change the way we elect town meeting members. But other than that, it was all about ranked choice voting. Next slide, please. And the minutes of the uh, Election Modernization Committee point that out. If you go to the minutes of the January 14th, 2020 meeting, uh, the discussion resolved or revolved around the statement that the primary reason for this committee was to pursue ranked choice voting. So we didn't get what we asked for. We asked for a study of our elections and we've got an advocacy organization for ranked choice voting. Next slide, please. The other thing they were supposed to do was listen to, to the voters, but they didn't do that. In fact, when I presented two uh, amendments to the ranked choice voting uh, proposition last year, they withdrew it and then stated that whatever I was doing was totally without merit. Didn't ask to talk to me, nothing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, they are telling you that the ranked choice will limit gamesmanship. It does not. All it does is it changes the game. Next slide, please. I run in for school committee in a race where we're electing three candidates. Right now, I'm telling folks, please vote for me but you have three votes. Use your other three votes, please do, because they all have the same value. And I have built coalitions with the other candidates who are running in this cycle. Bill Hainer and I come from totally different political constituencies, but I keep telling people, yeah, vote for Bill. He's a good guy, he does a lot of work. But if we go to rank choice for multi-seat elections, I can't do that anymore. What I have to do is I have to go and say, don't give me one of your three votes. My campaign is I need your number one vote. And number one votes will start appearing on campaign literature and campaign signs, just like Cambridge where candidates are pushing for number one votes. Next slide, please. multi-candidate elections with this added competitive edge will not be more civil, there will not be more collegial, they will not be more happy, they will be more intensely competitive. It will make the situation worse. Next slide, please. Multi-candidate ranked choice voting doesn't just change the way we count ballots. It changes the character of the election and it does it to the detriment of the way we campaign in town. My amendment will remove multi-seat elections from the ranked choice voting proposal before you. I hope you adopt that. But I also hope that even if you do adopt that, you vote this down until we've had an extensive chance for the community to come together and talk about the nine items that we wanted to talk about in terms of uh, reforming our elections and coming back with a comprehensive uh, package that will make elections better if it will work. Next slide, please. Please remove the most detrimental aspect multi-candidate RCV by adopting my amendment and then defeat the article and vote no action. Next slide, please. Look at this language in, number, in letter E. Look at that language. If you vote no action on the total package, you will defeat this language. Can you explain this to your constituents? Can you explain why you voted for that language? Next slide, please. And would you explain to folks why 
you would authorize the town clerk to have total authority to make any changes to ranked choice ballots and procedures possible if this is adopted. Next slide, please. Please remove the most detrimental aspect by adopting the Schlickman Amendment and then defeat the article and vote no action on Article 24. This is the best thing to do for Arlington. Let's have a real discussion of what will make our elections better in Arlington and then move forward for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, so what we're voting on here is Article 24. There is a recommended vote in the board of select select board report and that's spelled out mr schlickman now has an amendment to change that to make it for single seat elections only i believe and then we also have a second amendment by a miss friedman beth ann friedman let's bring beth ann out mr levy has a point of order what's your point of order mr levy Thank you, Mr. Matter, uh, Daily Precinct 18. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, my, my question is, um, is Mr. Schlickman's amendment out of scope? Because he clearly wants a no vote on the main amendment, on the main article. So well, he's just, his amendment is within the scope of, because he wants to amend the main article, but he's advocating for a no vote on the main article. But whether his amendment passes or doesn't, he's still advocating to vote down the main article. So I'm confused about, therefore, is his amendment out of scope? No, it's not out of scope. And yes, he can make that advocacy for the main article either way, regardless of his amendment. Okay, I just hope that for the purpose of making sure that we get out of here before the end of June, that further amendments like this are considered very thoughtfully or whether they're truly in scope or not, if the end result is something fundamentally against the purpose of the main article, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm Beth Ann Friedman from Precinct 15, and um, I have a very simple amendment um, to Article Number 24, and that's to add um, a subheading to Section 8B, uh, subheading G, that indicates the town clerks shall publish election results that show the tabulations by round. And one of my issues with the ranked choice voting, um, I understand the purpose of it and that it might um, avoid third candidates splitting a vote and um, <clears throat> ending up with a candidate that doesn't have popular majority of popular support. Um, but I think that it's really important that um, whatever, uh, calculations are made be really transparent. And um, so by this amendment, uh, when the town, if the town clerk publishes the election results that show the tabulation by round, you will actually see how the, um, the determinations of who won the election have been made. So I urge you to, to uh, support this amendment. Okay, do we have a second on Ms. Friedman's amendment? It's been seconded, thank you. Okay, now we have before us the recommended vote of the select board, Mr. Schlickman's amendment, Ms. Friedman's amendment. Uh, they are all subject to discussion. First to speak is Mr. Ciano. I'm mute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Frank Ciano, Precinct 15. So um, I support Mr. Schlickman's idea, but I'm trying to understand this ranked choice voting. The state voted against it, but Arlington voted for it, as I understand it. 
And then in the example that was given, where Mary has 36 votes, Diego 24, Robbie 28, and Sally 12 to fill a seat on the select board in the example given in the presentation, were there two seats open? And how does it end up that, that in the, so the first choice votes, so Mary wins and then her votes get spread over Diego, Robbie, and Sally. Can somebody explain that to me? I, I had Miss Seuss try and explain it to me back a month ago, and maybe I'm simple, stupid, and slow, but can someone explain it to me, please? Thank you. Um, the gentleman who gave us the presentation, can we bring him back? Yeah, uh, Greg Dennis, Precinct One, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Uh, yeah, Mr. Siano, um, so the colored page there has the example you're referring to. Yes. And so if you step through, so, um, so do you understand how Mary wins with a majority just in that first row? We drop the lowest vote getter and, and people get their vote counted towards their next choice and so on until we're down to two candidates. So how many seats have to be filled in that example? Two on the select board? Well, <clears throat> if we're filling, so in this example, if we're filling one seat, Mary wins that one seat. And that's the filling, end of it. If, if we're filling two seats, Mary wins the first seat. And then we just do this, we do the same tabulation over again, effectively, to fill the second seat. And if we need to fill a third seat, we do the same tabulation over again. So when we start the count for the second seat, if you voted for Mary first and Diego second, that means when we begin to count the second seat, your ballot's gonna count initially as a vote for Diego because Mary's already been elected. So your vote, when we start to do the tally for the second seat, will count instantly as a vote for Diego uh, when we begin the tally for the second seat. And, and that's what I don't understand, sir. So, so Mary apparently got 36 first choices and Diego got 24 first choices? Correct. I see. So then because Mary wins, you go to the second choices? Is that what happens? Because Mary wins, we start the counting from the beginning, counting the first choices, but also anybody that voted for Mary has their vote count towards their next choice and say, because Mary's already been elected. So Diego has in that first round, uh, 16 more votes than he did in for the second seat than he did for the first seat. So you can see from that that 16 of the people that voted for Mary first had voted for Diego second. So when we start counting the second seat, those votes instantly go toward to Diego. Okay, I guess I understand it. Complicated, but I understand it. Uh, I'm not in favor of it, but thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Ciano. Uh, Mr. John Warden. Hmm? There you go, John, you're well, live. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I um, uh, I wish to speak about the same uh, to the same uh, tenor as my esteemed colleague, Mr. Slickman. And that is, if it ain't broke, well, he said, don't break it. I would say, don't fix it. Um, this is a solution in search of a problem. Uh, the, um, if, let, let, let's just go back and, and think about history for a little bit. If Abraham Lincoln had been, if, 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 if we had national rank choice voting in 1860, Abraham Lincoln would not have been elected president. That would have meant that the Southern states would not have succeeded. The Civil War would not have happened. The horrible institution of slavery would have continued. 
that's maybe an extreme example, but it, it shows that the, the principle that the person who gets the most votes wins, whether it's 36% or 51% or whatever. And that principle has uh, long before that there was a town of Arlington, long before there was even a state of Massachusetts, it, since the colony, since the, as long as the colonies have been here in America, that is the way that our leaders have been chosen. Whoever gets the most vote wins. And it, it, and it, it could have in the very example that was used by the proponent, uh, if, uh, if the, let's say his first, uh, his first um, candidate, Mary, gets 49% of the vote and Diego gets 25% and, and the next guy, uh, Sally or somebody gets, gets 26%. Um, and all of, um, I don't know, who, 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 Diego's votes all go to Sally. She gets, so, 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 then, uh, so, so then she wins and, and Mary doesn't. Um, which means that basically, the person who almost got half the votes loses, and the person who got a quarter of the votes wins. And is that a way that we really want to uh, run our elections? I, I, I submit that that is not really a popular, a, a popular opinion. The um, the um, uh, at one of the uh, precinct meetings. Uh, which I attended, uh, I asked the, um, I, I pointed out, as has been cited uh, earlier, uh, the, the city of Cambridge, where they have, they call it proportional representation there. And there they're electing not three select persons or two select persons or three school committee members or whatever. Uh, they're electing a whole bunch, I think uh, perhaps a dozen city councilors. And uh, it, it stated, everybody says, give me your number one vote. Uh, and then they take some days and sometimes weeks to figure out, um, uh, well, who, who, who are the who are the lucky twelve they're going to get squeak in one way or another. Uh, I, I I don't, but and the, the speaker then said, oh well, don't worry about that. Uh, and it, I might say, as registrar of voters, I do know a little bit about elections, and I would say that this uh, this past uh, uh, spring, uh, when we we had an election. Unfortunately, very few people bothered to participate, about 20%, but we, we, we had our results by uh, before 10 o'clock tonight. And I don't think it's gonna be there that way, or at least I pointed out that that's unlikely to happen with this ranked choice business. He said, oh, well, no, not to worry. We have a computer program that is gonna make this work. And, and uh, I, okay, I thought, oh good, computers never let us down. Um, if you're a senior citizen like I am, and you tried to get you wanted to get vaccinated against the COVID, uh, get a, it's simple, easy for you to go in the town on, on the state website and, and get an appointment, wasn't it? Or, or let's, uh, let, let's, let's think of another example that would affect almost anybody. Um, suppose you wanted to get your car exam, uh, uh, sticker, your inspected to get your sticker during the month of April. Didn't work so well, did it? Because the state's computer had decided it, it, it didn't feel well or something, and they weren't issuing any stickers. And, and let's think about this very town meeting. Some of us, a lot of us, uh, some of us, I know I was one, were prevented from voting because the system here uh, was reverting to the connection is busted or, or something or other. And by the time we got around to finding where the heck the portal was, uh, it was too late to vote. So people were deprived of, of the right to vote because we're relying on a computerized system. So it used to, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States some, some years ago in a, a decision on, on uh, congressional districts he, uh, issued the, the famous edict, one man, one vote. But now, now of course we say, um, uh, to be correct, when ranked choice voting, we'd say one person, whole bunch of votes. And but beyond that, don't worry, computer will decide how the election is settled. And I, I submit to you, fellow town meeting members, that we, 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 we're better to have the people, you and me and all the other voters, voting for our leaders. Let the one who has the most votes win, and let's not let a computer decide who's going to be on, on any of our committees in town. Thank you. Thank you. That was John Warden, Precinct 8. He didn't. Oh, I'm Thank sorry. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Yeah. 
Uh, Mr. Dice, what's your point of order? Mr. Moderator. Mr. Deist. Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I would hope that you might be able to keep the discussion within scope a little bit better than it has been. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then again, um, everyone, name and precinct when you first log in. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deist. Uh, David Levy, Levy. Now, I'm not sure I should let him speak, but I'm gonna because his point of order was kind of an argument before. So David. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, David Levy, Precinct 18. Uh, I wanna move the question on all matters before it. Okay. Um, someone want to second Mr. Levy's motion to terminate debate. It's been seconded. We have a motion to terminate debate on the article and all matters before it. So we have th the main article and Mr. Schlickman and Ms. Friedman's article amendment. We're gonna make a motion to terminate debate. So town meeting members, um, please go over in batches of seven precincts, one through seven, then eight through 15, And finally, 16 through 21, we're going to confirm action. So we're going to open voting now. If you want a motion to terminate debate, if you want to terminate, please vote one for yes. If you, do want, if you want to keep discussing it, vote two for no. If you cannot, use the portal to cast your vote. Please try and chat your vote. So one for yes to terminate debate, two for no to continue discussing it. If you can't use the portal or the chat feature on Zoom, please text your vote to 614-575-9200. Six one seven five seven five nine two six six. If the chat, that's the third choice. And if all else fails, please call Miss Brazil, seven eight one six zero eight. Now wait a second. Seven eight one three one six three zero seven one. Seven eight one three one six three zero seven one. We're voting to terminate debate. One, yes to terminate. Two, to no to continue discussion. Okay, our voting time is up. We're just going to wait for our chatted and texted votes. So, Lauren or Ashley, when you're all set, give me the thumbs up. We good on the on the texted votes, Adam. I'm just waiting for my sign from our voting administrators that we're all set.
Okay, we're settled on chat on the chatted votes. Adam, you're good on the texted votes. Okay, let's close voting. The motion fails. 49%. So we'll go through these screens and we'll go back to the list. While we look through the screens, we'll go back to the list. And let's see, who was our next speaker? Well, we have to reopen it. So we have to wait for you to go through the three screens. So 115 in the positive, 118 in the negative. Two more screens to go through. And here we go. Let's bring back up the article. Uh, Brian Rierig was the next on the list, Mr. Rierig. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian Rierig, Precinct 8. I noticed that the uh, select board's vote on this was not unanimous. Um, I'd be interested in hearing um, the thinking of the minority. Um. Mr. DeCourcy, would you wish to tell us what your thought process was? You don't have to if you don't want to. Well, certainly. Then, then thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, yeah, as I said, when I presented the select board's recommendation, we were unanimous for a single seat RCV. The split was four to one on, on multi-seat. And my issue with the multi-seat, there's several, but one in particular is how the votes are redistributed. And uh, Mr. Ciano raise the question to Mr. Dennis, but in the multi-seat election that is presented and is in the proposed bylaw, uh, when you get to the second choice, the first choice voter, uh, the first place finisher, which is Mary, 26 of her second choice votes are applied, 10 of her third choice votes are applied in choosing a winner. Sally was the fourth place finisher, same thing. The last place finisher and the first place finisher in this example, both of their votes were redistributed second choice and in a couple of instances, third choices. Diego and Robbie, who were the second and third place finishers in that second round, none of their second votes were applied. So their first votes were applied to choose Mary as the initial winner. None of their votes, none of their second votes counted. And that's one of the, the criticisms about multi-seat ranked choice voting is you have to redistribute votes. If, in order to get to 50%, you have to keep redistributing votes. And in this example, the first place finisher, 36 votes, 26 second choice and 10 third uh, choice votes went to select the second place finisher. And with a 50% threshold, that keeps happening. Um, I will say that there was a lot of discussion among the election modernization committee about what form of ranked choice voting to use for multiple seats because there are a number of different options because it's difficult in terms of determining how you redistribute. And they, they chose a majoritarian approach uh, for the board. There are four or five communities across the country that use ranked choice voting for multi-seat elections, Cambridge being one of them for all nine seats. Some others use it as, as multiple seats come up in a cycle, none of them use this approach. Um, that was a big concern to me. It, it seems to me that if we have two votes now in a multi-seat election, the two votes count in the ranked choice voting uh, example here, they don't count for every voter. And, and, and first place votes certainly count, but there are scenarios here where the second choice vote does not count. Last thing I would say is that as to the confusion 
between a single seat election and a multi-seat election. East Hampton, Massachusetts adopted ranked choice voting. They adopted it for single seat elections. They did not for multi-seat elections. Um, and while they're discussing and moving towards that, that's, that's the way they voted it in. So for all those reasons, and, and one last point, um, Mr. Dennis said that the multi-seat ranked choice voting, you always have majority support for a winner. Well, that's not necessarily the case because if people don't use all their selections and you have to move down the line to second, third, and even fourth place votes, if those are blank, a majority is not going to result um, if there are exhausted ballots. So for those reasons, I support it for single seat. I, I just can't, uh, I can't get there. I don't think it's an improvement for multi-seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Does that answer your question, Mr. Eric? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eric. Anything further? Nothing further, Mr. Moderator. Thanks. Thank you. John Deist. I pass, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Dice. But we need to know who you are from now on. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, Chris Hyam, Christopher Hyam. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Christopher Hyam, Precinct 11. Um, could we bring up the text of the of the main article? Yes. In particular, section A. Okay. So my question, Mr. Moderator, is uh, on the concluded ballot. Uh, sec so section A, uh, number two. I have some questions about that that I hope someone can answer. Uh, okay. So in particular, the third clause in that sentence, um, the two or more sequential skipped ratings, rankings rather, um, what exactly does that mean? Uh, Mr. Heim, Attorney Heim, can you tell us what that means from a legal point of view? Doug Heim, Town Council. I'm sorry, Mr. Heim. Can you um, repeat which specific citation it was? Yeah. Um, so section A, uh, number two, the third clause, where it says contains two or more sequential skipped rankings before its highest continuing ranking. I believe what that's trying to capture um, in Mr. Dennis is uh, frankly the expert on um, ranked choice voting. But I believe what that's trying to capture is that there may be ballots that don't um, contain a preference for, you know, one, two, three, four, five in a, um, in a perfect order or may have equally prioritized votes in terms of what the highest ranking is so that you might have, someone might have voted for um, candidate A as their first choice, uh, didn't vote for anybody for their second choice um, and then voted for somebody for their fourth and fifth choice or something of that, uh, basically to that nature because ballots aren't necessarily gonna always be filled out perfectly. So this is trying to sort of I, my understanding is this is trying to capture those scenarios where um, there's a skipping of uh, the order of preference. I, I, I'd love to confirm that. I, I, that's that's my reading. Okay, we'll ask Mr. Dennis if you have that correct. Is Mr. Dennis still with us? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Greg Dennis, uh, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Um, Yes. So normally a skipped ranking is if somebody voted for a candidate first and then say in their first ranking and then didn't put anybody as their second ranking and then voted for a candidate in their third ranking. That would be a single skip. 
and a single skip, what would happen is that the candidate you put in the third rank would be considered as if it were your second choice, it would be promoted in that way. Um, but once you get to multiple skips, it becomes a little bit dubious to do the promotion like that. If you say voted for one candidate first, and then you skipped all the ranks and you voted for you know, some candidate fourth or fifth or something, um, it would be uh, probably uh, not a clear, a good reflection of the voter's intent to say, well, that was that voter's second choice. So once you skip two or more, we say, okay, after that point, um, the rest of the rankings are as if the, the voter left it blank because we don't want to consider those as if they were the voter's second choice. This is uh, pretty much standard procedure in most jurisdictions around the country. And uh, most of the, the language in here is you know, straight out of model legislation that's been passed in, in various places um, around the country. Thank you, sir. All right. so, so, somebody, so, so somebody could vote, as you're saying, as someone could cast a first place vote for a single candidate and then could cast a, you know, could potentially cast say two votes, uh, you know, second place votes for two candidates and that ballot would be good for the first candidate, but then would be thrown out for the further candidates. Similarly, if they voted for first and then they skipped two more and they went to fourth and fifth, that ballot would be good for the first, first choice, but thrown out for the fourth and fifth choice. Um, if they managed to cast it, the, the voting machine will detect an overvote. If you voted for multiple people in, in the same rank, it will detect an overvote like it detects overvotes today. And spit it back out to you. you. Spit it back out, and you have to go fix it, just like it does today. If you over. Yeah. So another question: How many you say in multi, other jurisdictions? How many jurisdictions use this particular, for this particular, uh, you know, algorithm for doing rank choice in multiple races? Uh, for multi-seat offices, yeah. it's growing pretty wait, rapidly. Wait. Um, there's... Hold on. <clears throat> Sorry. You got to wait for me to ask you to answer the question. I can't, lose, I can't lose. I can't lose control of the debate. So, Mr. Dennis, go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, yep. Greg Dennis, chair of the Election Modernization Committee. Um, yeah, there are a number of communities that do it. There, one of them is linked to on the, the ArlingtonRankChoice.org website, the website we created for this article, where it happens to be a, a, a video from Payson, Utah, that has a. We chose that because it's a particularly good video. This particular form is growing pretty rapidly, and, and I think in the next. Um, it's not quite as popular as the proportional form like in Cambridge today, but it's uh, getting another number of adoptions this year and, and uh, likely next year to soon overtake the proportional form as the most common way to elect uh, multi-seat offices with ranked choice. Mr. Moderator, is it possible yes, to get an actual like number? I don't, I don't know if he has that. Do you have an actual number of number communities or that use just Mr. Numbers? Dennis? Um, <clears throat> There's two cities in Utah. There's some jurisdictions in Virginia that I would need to go look up. Um, and then the adoptions this year um, are mostly in Utah from cities in Utah that because of some enabling legislation there. Uh, Salt Lake City, um, uh, Moab, I believe. That so we're talking 10, 10,000, 50, 500? Um, there's probably, uh, there's two definite cities today and next year there'll probably be like a dozen. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mr. Hahn? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator for thank you. using that out. Um, all right. I see that I'm over time, so I will simply say thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Patricia Muldoon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Patricia Muldoon, Precinct 20. And I'm also a warden for Precinct 6, and I'm also active with the Arlington League of Women Voters. And I'm also was appointed recently to the Election Modernization Committee. So this is an issue that um, is near and dear to my heart. I was first introduced to ranked choice voting at a national League of Women Voters conference 
probably back in the 90s, it was so much more fun then because we got to choose ice cream flavors and it was a lot easier to understand when my favorite chocolate got chosen. Um, but it is an issue that the league has long supported as being the fairest method. It is um, Arlington voted in favor of it uh, for state and national, um, but we this is our chance to move it forward so Arlington voters can have the opportunity to say yay or nay as to whether we would like to have it for local elections. And I think we, I think our voters would very much appreciate having the opportunity to make that decision. I would like to um, comment on a couple of things that have risen in this discussion. Mr. Warden had some concerns about computers being able to handle the count, but our new wonderful um, ballot tabulating machines that we have in all our precincts, the Dominion machines, uh, can handle this. They are currently counting our uh, ballots right now with all of our elections, and they can handle this kind of ranked choice voting. So they're going to be counting our, our ballots one way or the other. Uh, so that's not going to be um, out of their range of abilities. But um, I think it's really important to expand the diversity. There are issues in Arlington where sometimes I think people don't choose to run because it looks like, hey, we've already got those seats filled um, and we really need to get greater diversity. And I think with the opportunity to have um, not only your first choice, but maybe your second or third count, that that will get greater diversity in the town of Arlington. And we need that. We need more voices of a greater range. And I think ranked choice voting will really help that. And it will certainly increase voter turnout when we have greater competition. I'm always excited when we've got a range of candidates running for office, gay candidates, but this will give the voter greater control, I think, over um, how their votes are considered. And I think we really need that opportunity. So I think it's greater control for the voter. And I think it will expand our diversity in town. And I think we can all manage manage this process um, smoothly, I hope. Uh, so I think we should give the voters a chance to do it. And the whole idea of just choosing, well, let's do it for single seat versus multi-seat, drawing that variability. I think if we're gonna vote for the select board, it should be one system. And I think that system should be ranked choice voting. It shouldn't be one way one year, another way another year. So I think we should, should give this 14 member election modernization committee a chance to, to carry out our mandate. And this is a piece of the mandate. We are working to improve elections. And this is a very significant component of that to support uh, free and fair elections in the town of Arlington. And it's gonna be different from what Cambridge does. I hope it will be better, but I think it will be good for the town and for all of us. So I encourage folks to say yes to the original, um, the original um, article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Muldoon. Uh, Ms. Brazil. Yes, uh, Julie Brazil, uh, Precinct 12, and also the town clerk. I want to speak first, um, just as a, as a town meeting member and a voter, I have supported ranked choice voting um, in my heart for years and certainly was thrilled um, to have the discussion come to Arlington so concretely. Um, I do think it does give Arlington voters more choice um, 
and will uh, sort of improve uh, our local elections. Um, speaking as town clerk, I foresee no problems administering elections. Um, the, the process will be exactly the same. I will get the memory cards from the precinct workers and put them into um, the same device and the computer. This is the part the computers are good at. Um, the computer does the counting um, in, in all cases. And, um, and so I think we'll get quick results um, just exactly the same way we do now. Um, I appreciate um, Ms. Muldoon's comments, um, and, but I want to specifically focus on, um, on urging people to vote no on Mr. Schlichtman's amendment uh, as a person who has to try and explain how elections work to the voters. Um, I definitely agree that it would increase the complexity and confusion if the ballot is different sometimes and, and races are different sometimes. Um, I think we, it's much cleaner and more straightforward. And I strongly urge us to vote for ranked choice, um, but to keep it uh, you know, sort of pure and simple and not to, um, not to increase complexity um, as Mr. Schlichtman um, proposes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Brazil. Um, Gregory Christiana. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Greg Christiana, Precinct 15. Uh, first of all, I don't know how we can possibly know uh, what the second choice votes in the election of 1860 would be, considering that candidates would likely have run pretty different campaigns in the presence of ranked choice voting. I'll, I'll get to why in a moment. Uh, but I want to spend the, the rest of my time on more practical matters in the present day. Uh, I've studied ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting uh, myself. I'm, I'm not a member of any advocacy organization that advocates for ranked choice voting in any way. Um, I just have happened to study the topic and I have uh, first-hand experience campaigning for a race three years ago, which was decided by ranked choice voting for the first time in that district. Uh, so as a part of the of canvas, canvassing voters, I learned about and helped inform voters about ranked choice voting and the implications uh, in that race, uh, especially for the candidate that, that I was canvassing for. And what I found in my own personal experience and in my research uh, that I've done on this topic uh, is that candidates are more likely uh, to say nicer things uh, about each other with ranked choice voting, specifically because it's not just winner takes all uh, um, uh, on an individual's ballot. Uh, of course, not all candidates are going to say nice things about all the other candidates. It's not going to be some magical, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, civil, uh, uh, um, you know, ointment uh, um, that's going to cure all our divisions uh, and discord. Um, but uh, uh, with a wide field of candidates competing for a limited set of seats, the mechanics of ranked choice voting uh, actually encourages candidates in a lot of cases uh, who have similar priorities and similar constituencies to vie for first and second choice votes rather than sink their like-minded opponents with negative campaigning, which tends to be the case. Maybe not so much in Arlington, uh, but um, uh, that, that, you know, that is pretty prevalent in, in campaigns across the country. Right? And lastly, I uh, I, I support Ms. Friedman's amendment as I don't see any technical reasons that would hinder the implementation of that amendment, uh, but I'd be interested to learn more from the town clerk's office if there are any technical reasons uh, that publishing the tabulations by round would be uh, prohibitively challenging. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> Charles Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 8, speaking as a town meeting member. Um, <clears throat> I, I would just call us back to uh, Mr. Warden's comments. Um, voting for the winner based on who has the most votes is a, is a tradition that has worked in this country for three centuries. And I think it still works. I'm actually personally affronted by the suggestion from the voting uh, from the vote uh, modernization committee that voting a bullet is wrong. That seemed to be a, some sort of a basic fundamental of 
the reason to go to ranked choice voting. And I, I find it arrogant for somebody to tell me that I can't vote, that I can't choose not to vote for a candidate. The most voting for candidates or not voting for the candidate or candidate is one of the most fundamental principles of our democracy. And if, and if I'm being told that if I only vote for one candidate out of three, and that's wrong, uh, I, I, I'm just really disturbed by that. Listening to the whole argument, I have concluded that if I followed multi, uh, multiple choice uh, vo uh, voting, that I could wind up helping the candidate that I least liked get elected. And I hearken you back to Mr. DeCourcy's comments and, and his descriptions of his concerns. Truthfully speaking, could you understand what he was talking about? And the fact, it's really very difficult to understand. And it's not, it wasn't the fault of Mr. DeCourcy, it's the fault of just a fundamentally complicated and flawed proposal. Now, even Ms. Brazil said that she wanted this, uh, was opposing Mr. Schluckman's motion because it increases the complexity. She didn't say it made it complex. She said it increases the complexity. And everybody understands that this is a complex system and it can't work. Voting is not broken. Voting has been working for hundreds of years. This proposal reminds me of counting chairs in Florida. I suggest that you vote no on the entire article. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Joseph Coro. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Joseph Carroll, Precinct 15. <clears throat> I, I just want to address um, three things. Uh, the first is strategic voting. The second is turnout. And the third is my uh, own experience. Um, <clears throat> first, around strategic voting, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, uh, with bullet voting. But I think that um, you know people, people make their choices for a lot of different reasons. And I think in some cases, um, Voters might look at the slate of candidates running for, like maybe there are three candidates running for two seats, and they, they may decide that they like one of those candidates more than, than the others, but they, they feel very comfortable with, with um, the other candidates and would like to have the opportunity to, to um, express a preference uh, for uh, each of the candidates in the race. Um, Ranked choice voting gives them that opportunity and gives them the opportunity to, to actually rank their preferences. They're not forced to, to do it. There's nothing wrong if they want to, um, to, to bullet, but, but they, there also is no uh, particular advantage um, if they bullet. Uh, the second thing I wanted to address was um, turnout. And um, I know that part of the proposal of the Election Modernization Committee uh, suggests that um, you know going to ranked choice voting will uh, boost the number of candidates and boost turnout. I, I think that's still something that, that um, would need to uh, play out and need to be proven in, in, in practice. I, I do know that, that this past year, we, we had some competitive races and the turnout was 19.69%, um, but not, quite, not nearly as competitive, I think, uh, across the ballot as um, 2012, which was the year I was elected to uh, school, uh, to, I'm sorry, the select board, when we had 25.9% uh, turnout. The, at, in that year, as some of you may recall, there were five candidates for two seats on the select board, and there were six candidates for two seats on the school committee and some of the other races across the ballot were also um, uh, competitive. Um, myself and, and uh, Mr. Byrne were elected to the select board. And um, it, in that case, um, uh, one of us received 45.92% uh, of the of 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 the voters uh, cast a ballot for for us, um, and in the other case, 37.7%. <laughs> when you compound that with the low turnout, uh, that was a higher turnout than we typically see. But but um, in reality, um, you know, I was elected with 11, just over 11% of the uh, registered voters in town. Uh, voting for me, and um, you know, Mr. Byrne was was close. It seems to me that 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 the benefits of this system is that by allowing the ranked choice voting, 
you're you're electing candidates who are the most palatable to the most people who are, are voting. The turnout issue, I think this will address part of it. I think part of that is actually on all of us as town meeting members um, to, to, to help um, really you know, evangelize the importance of voting in, in, in uh, local elections. And I, I think a lot of um, my colleagues uh, do that very well, but clearly we have more, more to go. But that, that's the core principle to me is that, that this introduces the opportunity to elect leaders who are the most palatable to the most people who are, who are participating um, in the election. So I, I would urge you to vote against uh, Mr. Slickman's amendment and to adopt the um, recommended vote uh, of the select board. And I thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Coro. Eddie Stone. Betty, <clears throat> excuse me, Betty Stone, Precinct 7. Um, uh, I'm trying to distill my comments so as not to repeat things that other people have said. Um, I am very much in favor of the um, original Article 24 for rank, in favor of ranked choice voting, and I'm against Mr. Schlickman's amendment to exclude multi-seat elections. Um, the reason for that is that um, in particular, um, ranked choice voting for only single seat races would lead to, um, and I believe that um, Mr. Dennis mentioned this in his, origin, in his um, initial presentation, but I want to emphasize that it would result in inconsistent elections uh, because for example, in some of the um, more competitive and higher stake um, um, races such as the select board, in some years, if there were two vacancies, then it would be not rank choice, and in other years, if there was only one open, uh, one opening, it would be rank choice. And I, I find that the inconsistency goes against, um, is very confusing, and goes against the way the way a race should be presented. Um, I I want to emphasize that um, <clears throat> the proposal for multi seat elections is a straightforward application of the exact same single seat method, simply reapplied once for each seat to be filled. It's based on the same rationale and carries the same benefits um, as single seat races. From the voters' perspective, the voting process is identical for single or multiple seat elections. And I believe um, if I'm not, I, I believe that there is a built in um, lag of a year from uh, if this were to pass from accepting it, this as a, as a policy and actually um, implementing it precisely to allow for education of people so that they know how to vote. It's, a, it's, not, it's not a complicated thing. Um, and we have voting machines that have software and the capability to, to do the tabulations on the same time schedule. We'll have the, the results at the same time as they normally would come out with no additional expense. Um, and I think that in the races that are more competitive and more high stakes, such as um, the select board and the school committee to eliminate the benefits of ranked choice voting and end up with inconsistent, inconsistent voting depending on the years and, the de and depending on the number of vacancies that are available um, is not the way to go. Um, I uh, believe that a previous speaker uh, who had experience and some data from other elections spoke to the 
elections um, and the campaigning. And I, I just would like to speak to the point that elections are not about how candidates campaign um, as much as they are uh, about how giving the voters an opportunity to, to have their say. Um, and so I think I'll stop now and let other people have a chance to speak, but I'm very much in favor of the original um, Article 24 and very much against um, Mr. Schlickman's amendment. Um, I would vote in favor of um, Ms. Friedman's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mrs. Stone. Uh, Daniel Jelkut. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Daniel Jalcut, Precinct 6. Um, I think the core question here in this whole uh, article is, can we make our election system better or will we make it worse? And I think that's everybody's comments on the subject boil down to that. I had the sort of unusual experience of uh, the privilege of being in a class about 20 years ago with the famous songwriter and mathematician, Tom Lehrer. I was at UC Santa Cruz when he happened to be teaching a class, mathematics, I think he called it mathematics for liberal arts. And he uh, proposed that there is no such thing as a perfect election strategy. And that really struck, struck me because even back then, probably misremembering this, probably more like 30 years ago, to be honest. Um, even back then, uh, I was thinking about things like ranked choice voting and um, wondering what, what can we do to make democracy more fair? And um, to have him, you know, a person of authority to my mind, say there's no such thing as a perfect election strategy. It could have made me come away with a feeling that we shouldn't bother. Why, why even pursue democracy? Why pursue the idea of voting for what the people want if we can't perfectly execute it? But I think what I came away with is even though there may not be a perfect strategy for voting and for elections, uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to move closer to a perfect strategy. Um, even if it's not possible to perfect it, I think most of us can agree there are so many problems with the winner takes all approach that we're so used to that it's worth trying something new. And there are so many things to be said for the kind of ranked choice voting approach that is proposed by this article that I am in support of it. Um, and I am also, not in support of an amendment that would change it to only apply in certain races. Uh, the, the, the arguments against this article seem to boil down to it being complicated, um, but I think it's more complicated to us who try to understand it and analyze it at like a, you know, a, a legal point of view kind of kind of way of thinking of it. I think it's not that complicated to propose to a typical voter that you simply put into a list in order the people you would most prefer to represent you. It's not complicated at all. It's complicated when you try to break it down into what does this mean on a mathematical level? What does this mean? when there are skipped votes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, there may be some issues to figure out, but it's not complicated to ask somebody, if you had your choice, who would you elect? And then if you had your second choice, who would be next? And then if you had a third choice, who would that be? So I think it's pretty simple to the voters and that's what's most important here. Um, Somebody else raised uh, a criticism about the ranked choice voting that if somebody uh, did
didn't vote for a second or third candidate, then their second or third vote, they would ne- they would not they would not be represented at all in the vote. And to be honest, that is exactly the situation we face when people choose on their own accord not to vote in an election at all. They choose to not be represented in the vote that elects somebody. And if you're voting in a ranked choice voting and you vote and your first vote gets disqualified and you choose not to place a second, third, fourth, whatever vote, then you are choosing effectively not to vote. It, there's precedent for that. It's not a great uh, tragedy if somebody is quote unquote not represented when they choose not to vote. Uh, So I would summarize by saying I am very much, if it's not obvious, for this article, and um, I'm against the Schuchman Amendment. I don't see anything wrong with the Friedman Amendment. Again, as somebody previously mentioned, unless there is some uh, non-obvious reason that that would be difficult, I think the transparency of reflecting the voting order uh, would be good. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jalcut. Um, <clears throat> Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. If you can't hear me, tell me now. Um, I would like to uh, make a couple of points here. Um, The first point I'd like to make is that what we're debating here is not whether or not we like ranked choice voting. What we're debating here is whether or not to put ranked choice voting on a ballot and allow the voters of Arlington to choose whether or not they would like to implement this method of voting. So that all of the people who are arguing against ranked choice voting here are arguing against the article itself and they will have an opportunity to vote in an election on whether or not they want to implement ranked choice voting when we put it on the ballot for the rest of the town to vote on as well. So I think it's important to remember that when you make your decision about what you're gonna support and not support here. Um, I think Mr. Schlickman's argument about competition in elections, his suggestion that elections would be somehow more competitive and people would be jockeying more actually is uh, an argument in favor of ranked choice voting, because I think ranked choice voting, if it makes more can- brings more candidates into the races, simply says that more people are gonna take a bite at the apple and more people are gonna get excited about campaigns and more people are gonna vote and voting is addictive. Once you've done it once, you want to, to do it again. So I think it actually will um, improve our democracy, which I think is what uh, perhaps Um, the uh, election modernization committee is considering. Um, I do have one question, which is that um, Mr. Schlickman suggested that the election modernization committee has been uh, only paying attention to this matter. And I wonder whether or not that's true and whether or not perhaps there's someone on the board of selectmen who could um, mention whether or not they have had interim reports from the committee and what other issues the committee has considered um, or whether the Board of Selectmen believes the committee is not fulfilling its mission. I think those issue, questions are outside the scope of the article. Um, they were inside you, the scope of Mr. Schlickman's argument and you didn't stop him. Yeah, but he didn't ask questions about them. So how about if we get answers to those questions? It's 1056. We'll come back on Wednesday and have a couple answers for you. Do you have anything else you wish to discuss? You want us to hold you open? Or do you want to finish off now and have us give you answers Wednesday? Um, well, I, I would suggest that regardless of those answers, which I would like to have simply because I believe that uh, the committee has been slandered. Um, regardless of those answers, I support us putting ranked choice voting on the ballot and allowing the voters of Arlington to decide whether or not they would like to implement this method of voting. I also support Ms. Friedman's amendment because I think being totally transparent about the calculations is a good idea. I urge you not to vote for Mr. Schlickman's amendment, which I believe guts the purpose of the article entirely. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. 
Okay, it's 1057. We're going to preserve the speaker list. If anyone has a motion for reconsideration on the one article that we passed tonight, um, please use the raised hand feature in Zoom right now and give us your notice of reconsideration. And otherwise, I would take a motion to adjourn till Monday. Uh, we passed one adjourn. article. Yeah, we have a motion to adjourn. We have a second. 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 If anyone objects to adjourn, please use the raise hand feature. Also use the raise hand feature if you want to file a notice of reconsideration. So at this rate, um, passing one article a night, we'll be here for another 30 nights. That's just something for us to consider between now and Wednesday. Okay, we'll see you all Wednesday night. Thank you and good night all.